Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth. Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a lifelong real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder and team leader of Streamlined Properties. Whether you're looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just for a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. Welcome back to another week of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. Got a great show for you. I know you've heard that before, but this time you might actually know our guest from something outside of real estate investing. But before we get to the show, remember to follow the podcast wherever you listen to. We've seen a ton of subscriptions on Spotify, which we love to see, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts, that's the best place to subscribe. So you get it Monday and Thursday mornings. And of course, when you have the time, drop us a five-star review. This is going to be a good one. My guest this week is Devon Kennard. You may know him from several years in the NFL, but he's going to talk to you about how it all adds up, designing your game plan for financial success. That is also the title of his new book. He also has a lending company. We're going to go all through it. Let's get to it right now. This is episode 107 of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with my guest, Devon Kennard. You may know him from the NFL, but this guy has way more going on. He always saw himself as an athlete, investor, and author. He does have a new book out now called It All Adds Up, Designing Your Game Plan for Financial Success. And Devon has gone quickly into real estate from the time he started NFL up to at least 20 single family, smaller multifamily properties, as well as 40 plus syndication investments. And last thing, he now has a private lending company, 42 Solutions. We're going to talk about it all. Devon, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm glad uh, we we're able to make this happen. And it was great being on the on the panel with you at Bigger Pockets, man. Yeah, man. I think that was so it was exciting to kind of like meet in person because a lot of these times I haven't met somebody before, but we got in, we were on the panel at Bigger Pockets and that went well. What did you think of that whole event? Like, cause I, that was the first time I was actually at BPCon and we were there, you know, together on stage and our room was packed. It was like overflowing with people in the back. I was like, this is people really want to learn. Yeah, I, I was really impressed with the whole experience. It was my first time at yeah. BP Con, and there's a ton of knowledge, a wealth of knowledge. But if you're really taking advantage, I think it's the networking opportunities yeah. Yeah. and yeah. some of the private conversations is what is what I took most from it because it really kind of broadens your perspective of like, wow, okay, I could do this, I could go this direction. So you know, I, I kind of left motivated, and the timing yeah. was perfect because it's kind of the last quarter of the year, getting ready for 2024, and it really shifted some of my goals for for you know next year and beyond yeah and i mean i can tell just from watching obviously we're friends but i watch on social media and then like you know, you get through bp con and then like hey wait there's you and james james Daynard. like you guys are doing <laughs> stuff like you can see that just going building the relationships immediately turns into more advantageous relationships and business possibilities you know from that and i think that's important for everybody to learn Especially what you said, which is really we called lobby con. <laughs> you know, there's BB yeah. con and there's people talking, and then everyone's in the lobby, you know, networking the whole time. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so going back, I'm sure you were playing sports, obviously, growing up because you ended up in the NFL. But when you were younger, did you think about real estate at all? As a young kid growing up, no, not at all. I knew I wanted to be successful primarily through football, but like yeah. I had a vision for what I want, wanted my life to look like. And football was the vehicle that I always envisioned getting me there. But as I got older, I started to get into college and I was facing adversity in football that made it look like it wasn't going to be possible. Mm. And that made me ask the question, like, do I want to be successful because 
I'm an NFL player one day or do I want to be successful, period? And when, you know, my career is in jeopardy football wise and it's like, all right, well, I still want this lifestyle that I always envisioned for myself. So how am I going to get it without football? And that question is what saved my financial life, I, I think, because it completely changed my perspective and really kind of lit a fire in me to figure what I was going to do. And, you know, real estate really started to draw on me. And, you know, that, that's where I took off with it from there. Yeah, that's so important because I know I'm sure you have friends and people obviously through the NFL who are just like, no, it's NFL or bust. And then it's a bust and you have to start over, you know, and that would be so hard. Did you feel that a lot of people have started to change their mindset? I've actually noticed it just from like watching from afar that so many people now, as opposed to 20 years ago, are like exceptional business people while also still in sports. And you just wanted to be ahead of the curve on that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think the game is changing and more guys have that mindset. But a big thing that kind of always lit a fire under me while I was in the NFL was the fact that it's oftentimes the big names like, all right, it's easy uh, not easy. I don't want to write them off, but like when you're, you know, LeBron James and Patrick Mahomes and you have all this money and a full team and staff behind you, it's easy to like, oh, you have this private equity fund that like, you know, you found this business partner who really runs it and you're the, you're yeah. like, um, that, that's easier. But there's a lot of guys who m maybe make some good money or not that great of money, like who aren't as big of a name, but you, there's an opportunity to take advantage of that brand as an athlete, leverage it to open doors and give and put resources in front of you that can really help you take off. And, you know, that was my perspective is, you know, I had a lot of success while I played in the NFL, but I was never necessarily a household big name like that. But yeah. I was like, I want to I want to change the narrative to where it's like guys like that can really make big moves as well. Not just, you know, the Patrick Mahomes, the Tom Brady, the LeBron James. So I really encourage guys throughout the locker room, not just, you know, the the big names to, hey, find out what else you want to do. But the the uh, conversations are different because when you're not that big name, it's like you're you're innate mindset is like, oh, I got to grind so I can, um, yeah. you know, be completely locked in so I can become that big name. But by doubling down and just being all football, you're ac it's actually hurting you because if you're not that big name, you know, it's going to end. You maybe made some good money, but you need to figure out what's next. So, you know, I've realized, uh, kind of put that in perspective and I try to help guys realize that as well who are in the league. Yeah, I feel like football of all the sports is the most tenuous because you could get injured on any single play. I mean, every weekend I'm watching Red Zone and I'm like, oh, here we go. You know, here we go again. So that's something, again, that if you're not planning for, it could really be like if you get injured and you're, you know, I don't know what happens with rookie contracts and stuff, but like it's not going to be easy if you can't go back. And then there's a whole right. thing about what it's like to not be an athlete anymore. So what was it that you think that drove you? Was it just what you knew you wanted to be as successful? And only part of that had to be NFL for you. Yeah, I would say it kind of goes back to my youth in that my dad played in the NFL as well. And seeing his career in life, like I was young when he played, he retired when I was like five years old. So I got to see his life a lot after the NFL. And that put a yeah. lot in perspective for me to where it's like, wow, there's so much life after football. And having that perspective, you know, really helped me because it's like, all right, even if everything goes perfect, I'm going to have so much life on the other end of this. Let me figure this out. But, you know, the, the other thing is the idea that I wanted to have a perspective of like not just choosing to be good at one thing, but trying to all the roles and all, all the different roles I play in my life, trying to excel at them, whether that's being a student, being a son, a, now a husband, a father, like all of these different things. And I've, I found when, you know, you like don't just focus on one thing and you really tr put your best foot forward in all the different priorities you have they affect each other. The better father I am, it makes me a better football player. It makes yeah. me a better investor and so on. So having that perspective has helped me a lot. And it's reason why, like, I I got good grades in school. You know, I'm one of the few athletes who graduated with his undergrad and master's degree before he got drafted. And it's not because I'm outrageously smarter than, than the next guy, but I had that perspective of like, I got to be here anyways. Let me put my best foot forward. 
Yeah, I love it because I mean, I created this as a mindful approach to real estate investing. And that's really thinking ahead, you know, not thinking like, hey, just get it done. It's like, I really like what you said about, you know, if you're if you're being a good father, then you're going to be happier, you know, and then that then it's like you're going into a room with investors. And now it's like, wait, I'm networking with people who are going to help build me up as opposed to the people who are negative on everything, you know, and then that that can go the wrong way as well. Then you come home and you're negative and nobody wants, you know, that person coming home and bringing it home. Yeah, they, it all affects each other. And, you know, that's why I even get mad nowadays when I hear people, you know, say like, oh, you, you care too much about money or money doesn't matter. Or I don't care about money or like who just don't take their financial life seriously. Because analogy that I like to give is your financial well-being affects your physical, mental, emotional and even spiritual well-being. And a great example, you know, being an African-American, I think of a lot of family members, friends I know. And if their grandmother is sick, they're not going to the doctor because it's like, oh, that doctor, they're just going to charge me this and that. I don't need to. When if you're in a good financial standing, yeah. your perspective on that's completely different. You know, you, you got a cough right. and I'm and you're sending your grandma or, or you're going to the doctor and you're getting blood work every year. And you're like your your mindset about your health and your well-being shifts because, you know, you're in a financial place where you can afford it and you realize taking care of yourself is seriously. So that's just one example. But I think there's examples like that in every other avenue of your life. And when you realize that, I think that should be a motivator for people to take, fin uh, you, you know, their financial life more serious. Yeah, I completely agree. And I feel like a lot of people who grow up with a scarcity mentality get into that. They're like, well, we just don't go to doctors, you know, because they're that's just not a good spend. I'll be fine. But that's that, you know, that's again, that's not living your best life, then you're coughing all the time. And then that's going to, like you said, affect everything else. When you first decided real estate was going to be a vehicle to something else later, how did you start? You know, you're already, you know, successful in football, but where do you start as someone who's like, hey, now I'm a brand new investor? How'd you get started? As you know, like I, I believe real estate's all about relationships and knowledge and then taking action. So I didn't know that at the time when I started, but I was building relationships. And when I was in college, even before I knew I wanted to get into real estate, I was good at making sure I took care of the classroom and trying to network and meet as many people as I could because I understood yeah. the idea that – I was a college player and then I was an NFL player. No one was going to be as interested in me as they are when I was in those moments. I see it already. I just retired and I still get a lot of love, but it ain't the same. You know, it, the, the love ain't the same as, oh, I'm a current player and I just had a sack on Tom Brady and now right. I'm retired and I'm talking about, oh, I used to play. Like, you know, people respect it, but it's not the same level of love. So I recognized that while I was even in college and I leveraged the relationships and, you know, I, I've told this story many times, but one of my mentors, uh, I met him my, my redshirt senior year in college and I went into his office and he's a real estate investor, but started off as a police officer and dude had a t-shirt on some jeans. He was standing up. He had one of those um, desks that can move up or down yeah, yeah. and you could tell he ran the show. And, and, you know, like I came in there with the suit and tie buttoned up, like trying to impress him. And, yeah. and it, I just remember leaving like man, I want to be the guy who can, who can come to the office like that. And <laughs> hearing his story about like, he was a police officer, house hacks, bought one property, turned it to two, so on, so on. And I'm like, if he did that off a of police officer salary, not trying to pocket right. watch, but we can all estimate what a police officer gets paid. Yeah. And I'm like, if he's able to build that, then what can I do if I play in the NFL or even if I don't, like I can figure out how to make that much. So, yeah. you know, that that's where the spark went off. And I started diving into books, podcasts, learning. And after my rookie season, I made my first investment. Yeah. And what was the first investment and where was it? Beach Grove, Indiana. Oh, all right. Three, three bed, two bath. A uh, single family turnkey property from a from a turnkey provider, which is essentially a flipper who's flipping at scale and selling yeah. stabilized assets. Bought it for eighty seven thousand dollars with a partner. I put twelve k. He put twelve k. I yeah. did the loan in my name, and it was a great property. It cash flowed great for us. Pocketed a few hundred dollars a month each, you know, for many years, and then. We couldn't scale because that same turnkey provider ghosted me. So ghosted That's me, which I, <laughs> which I realized, all right, I got to make sure I can scale in markets that I want to invest because yeah. this one property was nice, but 
I got a property in Beach Grove and I'm probably not buying anymore. So we right, ended up right. selling. I made a great return. I think I netted 26. So we each netted 26. Um, nice. So got our money back plus, you know, plus 14K, not including cash flow along the way. So it turned out to be a great deal for us. And, but that kind of sparked it, that whole process. And I kept buying. I started getting the, in the real estate syndications. And I just, every year, I was like, I got to keep stacking up. Yeah, I think it's important that you're, you know, you go in, you, it worked, like your first investment worked, but you also learn something about whatever turnkey company. And that that's very common across the board with turnkey. When you after that first turnkey, did you still do turnkey just different operators and figuring out different markets where you could get more in the same area? Yeah, so I definitely stayed with Turnkey, and I stayed in the Midwest um, ish. I started buying in Ohio and then Kansas City, and for all the same reason, I was finding three bed, two baths, and good neighborhoods yeah. for 100k or less that stabilized. You know, so uh, some would argue and like shake their head. You were buying Turnkey, but it's like stabilized. I was getting eight to eight to ten percent return cash right. on cash, buying fully cash, and there are markets that were appreciating, not necessarily outstanding, but pre appreciating okay. Steady, but cash flow, yeah. cash flow was great. So it just it made sense uh, to me. And with the amount of time I had, because obviously my main thing was football, I felt like the Turnkey route was the way to go because. I, growing up, I knew nothing about putting hammer to nail and figuring out how to d deal with any of that. And I didn't have the bandwidth. I consider myself a passive investor, yeah. especially while I was playing. So I'm like, I don't have the bandwidth to to learn the the nicks and crannies of of this. So let me buy stabilized asset. But that's really important. I mean, I think whatever job somebody's doing or profession they have, if you're looking to offload some capital into real estate investing and you don't have a lot of time, like you don't want to buy a five unit, you know, when you're brand new, because the management part, you're either going to have to pay a lot and then you're going to have to manage a manager. So you were really ahead of it and knowing like, OK, well, I want something that's pretty hands off. It comes with, pro you know, property management. It's turnkey. It's ready to go. And if you can walk into eight or 10 percent, you know, and and be spending a hundred grand per property, and the rents are probably like fourteen, fifteen hundred. You know, which exactly. is pretty much the norm. Like that's solid, and and you can go on knowing, like, hey, I'm going to play the whole season, and then off season, like, uh, check up on the properties, right? Make sure yeah. you add a couple more. Yeah, I really like that strategy. So, was there a time where you decided like real estate was becoming much more than you thought it would be? I just started to like. That was my t uh, teaser, that and then investing in syndications. My first syndication was a debt fund, which kind of ties into, you know, my private money lending company yeah. I own now. But because I like my thing was I was looking at a lot of investment opportunities and most guys were in the stock market when I first got in the league. And I'm like, it's going up and down. And if I get out <laughs> of it and if I'm out of the league. How's it helping me pay my bills? So for yeah. me, this real estate, I could buy this property and it's giving me an 8% return. I could easily do the math. Like, oh, I buy five of these and it could give me 5K, let's call it. And I know that's going to pay for my car note and a decent apartment in whatever city I want. Like, yeah. I, at least I got some some leeway and, and whatever money I got in the bank from the NFL, I, like that holds me over. I, I got time to figure it out. So for me, that just uh, that uh, like really clicked and made a lot of sense for me to where it's like retirement is great. But like I have so many people invest with like 50 years down the line. And yeah, I'm like, yeah. can I find investments that like work for both like now and later? Yeah. And for me, um, real estate is that it works now and later in providing the cash flow and being able to get income now. But also, obviously, it's going to appreciate and it, and it gives me a tool that I can leverage in different ways, refinancing, selling, et cetera, yeah. down the line. So, yeah, exactly. I, I was just listening to On the Market and Henry, who was on the panel with us, <laughs> uh, he was a moderator, Henry Washington, and somebody asked him, like, do you like cash flow or appreciation? And he said, yes. And I was right when he was saying it. I was saying it to myself. Yes, I'd like both. But it's like, as for some reason, people think that you have to choose one or the other. But if you're smart, you can find one. Maybe the appreciation is less if the cash flows more, but you still want to be focused on, on those. How are you choosing the neighborhoods? Was it what the turnkey providers had? Or were you doing some demographic research based on where you've lived and what you knew to decide on those first few neighborhoods besides the Beach Grove one? Yeah, so I, I would say... I was leveraging relationships to find the the best locations. So when you're a real estate investor, and I don't care if you're way more experienced than me, just starting out, it doesn't really matter. You need to figure out your distinct advantage. 
because if you have no advantage, you're, you're going to struggle. So for me, it wasn't time or knowledge of how to renovate a property. I had capital. And because I was an athlete, I can get access to the, the best people possible because I was an athlete and I, and I started to be able to talk the language. Yeah. I understood cap rate and cash on cash return and ROI. And, and I, so now it's like, oh, this guy's an athlete and this. So I was building relationships with the highest person I can find in the turnkey providers, which is usually the people who founded it. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, hey, let me buy some, but I want to be in your cream of the crop locations, properties, right. like, you know, and, and that is going to cash flow the best, like get me in those best ones. And they would kind of point me in that direction, tell me why I would, you know, do a little bit of the background, um, you know, research on my own and then be like, okay, let's, let's go. And I felt like it was mutually beneficial because I'm providing them a buyer of turnkey. Like I'm a buyer who can, who's showing that I could buy at scale. So do right by me. And yeah. I'm going to come back to the well over and over. And so it's like, like I was, that's was became uh, becoming my distinctive advantage that yeah. I kind of found. And I tried to lean into that as much as I could. I yeah, still I love do. it. I'm, I'm saying yeah. it like path, like, but yeah, that's, that's kind of my strategy. Cause I still consider myself a passive investor even today. So like, that's, that's the lane. I have some capital. And I know that I know the knowledge, and I'm gaining the, the knowledge even more. And I, I'm just trying to leverage that into the right relationships because I never want to be cold calling. I never like that's not what I'm interested in. You know, like for me, while people were learning how to do that, I was trying to figure out how to sack Aaron Rodgers. So I'm not yeah. going backwards now. <laughs> yeah, no, but that makes sense. And I remember the first time I talked to you when we were at BPCon, that was it. You're like, no, I mean, I don't want to do all that. I'm building relationships so I can make it as passive as possible for you, which is partners and then syndications. What have you found in syndications? Like, how are you choosing the syndications that you're investing? I know it's going to start with relationships. Are you relying more on the relationship than the actual assets, assuming that the operator like, hey, we're good. If they tell me this is good, I'm going to go in. So I, I started out, I actually found a financial advisor who folk, um, who concentrates on alternative investments, which like exactly what a syndication is, real estate back. So, yeah. you know, he has relationships with the SEC. He's reviewing and underwriting these syndications all over the country, knew a ton of great operators. So mm. sometimes people don't believe me when I say yeah. I'm in 40 or more syndications. And that's why it's not like I'm doing it myself, finding 40 G um, GPs to work with, but I, I, found and, and started working with an advisor who that's all he focuses on day and night. So he taught me the game. He, um, you know, I know what disposition fees are, acquisition fees, the things to look for. And, you know, as we we're going, he was like, well, this is why I think it's a good deal. This is why I don't or, you know, in teaching me how to evaluate a deal. And that gave me a lot of confidence and perspective. But it was a challenge for me because I'm looking around and I'm like, this makes sense to me. But I didn't see a lot of people doing it. So yeah. that was like the the struggle I had my whole career um, until I got confident enough where it's like, I don't really give a damn who is or isn't doing it. I believe in this. It's starting right. to work for me. But like early on, it's like, all right, you're breaking this down and it makes sense. But, uh, you know, oh, I get a pref, an 8% pref. And then it's a 70-30 split. And this is the waterfall. And, oh, you know, the hold is three to five years. Or this is a development deal. So it's five to seven. Like the language of it was starting to become second nature. And I was yeah. understanding it. But I just didn't see a lot of people doing it. So that's what was had me scared. But with knowledge and really diving in, I got more and more comfortable. And till moving forward to today, my mindset more so is like the syndicators who have done really good by me, I'll always consider yeah. going back to the well. But oh, in big picture wise, as that money full cycles and comes back, I'm going to be buying more and more of my own stuff. I really got into syndications because I didn't have the bandwidth yeah. to invest like I wanted and needed to smart and conservatively. With um, So I was buying and building my own portfolio, but not at the clip that I needed to, to really do what I oh, wanted to do. So you know, as those, as that money from syndications come back, I'm, I plan on growing my personal portfolio. Yeah, but that's the perfect setup. You know, they're all set up and whatever year, they are a three year, they are a five, they are a seven, maybe one's a 10. So it's like, you have a little scale that you can see like, okay, I have this money coming back at this time. And you already have targets for what you want. So I love that though, you set yourself up when you were, you know, busy or obviously with in, in the NFL. And now it's like, okay, now you can focus on this, focus on your lending company and start to kind of like focus 
build this funnel of all the things that you want to do. Hey, it's Jonathan. This is a brief interlude from the episode so I can talk to you about the fact that my real estate team, the on-market version, we just changed brokerages. So now we're at Real, which is Real Broker, LLC, and it is a progressive brokerage. We're super excited to be there. And one thing about what we do is we are an on-market investor-friendly real estate team. So you're probably here because you're interested in real estate investing or you're an experienced real estate investor. We work with hundreds of real estate investors because we are focused on understanding investor dynamics. 99% of real estate agents don't understand what investors are looking for. We do. It's my background and I bring it to my team every single day. So if you are looking for investor assistance in the state of New Jersey, we have you covered. Parts of New York, good. A little bit of a part of Nevada, all good. Also, if you don't know an investor-friendly agent in your area and you need help, just reach out to us. We will connect you. We have investor-friendly friends who are agents all over the country. Let's get back to the show. So when those monies start coming back in, what's your target personally? Like, what are you looking to buy next for yourself? The most recent thing I bought was a sixplex. I talked about it um, at Bigger Pockets, sixplex in Tampa. I like the Tampa market. I'm local yeah, here great. in Arizona, so I'm always looking in Arizona. I still own some of those turnkey properties I was talking about in Kansas City. I sold Ohio. We talked about that a little bit. Yeah. We can touch on that if you want, but yeah. sold in Ohio. So those are the three markets that I'm I'm in now, and I'm going to continue to look in those markets because they've been good to me, but I'm not opposed to a new market. But for me, I want to go to markets where I can scale. Like I'm like, I want to be able to feel like I can buy 10 to 20 units, whether that's some smaller multifamily, a bunch of single family, whatever. But I got to be comfortable in saying like, I, I can see myself buying 10 to 20 here and I have the team in place. I'm comfortable and confident in that. So if, and obviously the numbers make sense the neighborhood yeah. and there's a true buy box. So I've spent the second half of this year getting my bookkeeping in order. I hired a bookkeeper. I'm really diving into that. So I know exactly where every dollar went for 2023, the direction of my portfolio, where I'm at, so I can have the clear vision. I'm almost done kind of wrapping the year up with that. And that's going to give me the ultimate clarity. And then I plan on digging deep and figuring out, okay, what market do I want to keen on the absolute most and kind of take off from there? Yeah, I feel like getting like all the finances in order and knowing where all your money is, what's going in, what's coming out, which ones are the best investments really puts a confidence level, even on somebody like you, who's confident, but like, yeah, I need to clean up my books. And like, I know when I do it, I'm going to be like, wow, okay, I've been misusing some of these funds. Now I'm going to be at max, I'm going to use everything like the best way. And like you said, because of your relationships, you can say, well, they they say like, oh, you have whatever it is, 150k coming in. And then you say like, okay, well, what are the options to deploy this? And you can really start to figure out what assets will then give you growth and then multiple growth. And I, I really like the structure. I like I'm just starting to get into syndications and I've been doing this like, you know, more than 30 years, but I see it the same as you, you know, you look at syndications first and a lot of us were like, that seems like a scam. Can it really be like this passive and easy? And then you realize like, no, other people are doing the hard work. They're going to get the portion of it for that. And we're going to get the back end payments. Do you like that? It's just already so diversified that, you know, you know, you have some syndications, you have some personal deals, you have the lending company, which I think is a great option, especially now. Does that make you feel kind of like a little bit more overall diversified so that when markets kind of go down, you know, or rates go up that you're fine? Yeah, I, I feel very kind of conservative. I, I consider myself pretty conservative and having different buckets because majority of my portfolio is in real estate, but it's completely different. Like I'm in syndications all across the country. I have my personal yeah. portfolio and I lend. Those things are all real estate based, but like there's diver diversification all throughout. You know, I lend in different states. I own properties in different states. I do, I'm in syndications in different states. So, you know, I feel like I'm protected in that sense, you know, and that provides a great opportunity. And like you said, that waterfall that's going to hopefully be happening for me every year or two, having new funds come in, hopefully generating a lot of income. It, you know, hopefully I'm going to be able to sustain my lifestyle and have a ton of money to continue to keep buying. And, you know, that's a good balance that, you know, I've been seeking. 
Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, if you look across the asset classes, are there it, with the syndications? I know just from reading, you really you also have a lot of different classes of assets. You have some senior living, self storage. Is it more interesting to you when you're looking at syndication deals or any type of partnership to get a little bit of all these assets to see how you like it and what the returns are like? Oh, absolutely. And then, you know, you get to see, you know, I'm in I'm in some dental offices. They have a niche where they buy that in the Midwest. They focus on mm. dental office, like triple nets in the and it's been awesome. It's one of the funds I'm in. And then senior yeah. living centers. I I'm in a deal in, in a hotel in Tempe that I'm I'm in a syndication for. So it's like the diversity of different things is is really cool. And you kind of get to look at how they see numbers on a big scale with large projects. And that gives you a lot of perspective and, uh, you know, direction of like, okay, this is this is what's going on in this market. This is what's going on in this asset class. So that diversity has been it's been cool because my personal portfolio is primarily single family and smaller multifamily. But to have access to these bigger deals has been cool. But it's also it. I realize I'm a bit con- uh, control freak and full transparency. <laughs> There's one syndication that I got in and there was a capital call r- right now that that's going on. And to be honest, I did it outside of my financial advisor. I got yeah. a little cocky. I felt like, oh, you know, I've been doing this 10 years now. And yeah. I actually met him at a conference. You know, I'm not going to name any names, but met him at a yeah. conference. And, you know, I knew a couple of people who've invested in it. He gave me the rundown, sounded good, but he didn't have the right debt structure, didn't anticipate that debt was going to go this high for this long. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's pretty much then what I really didn't appreciate is he waited till it was an emergency and didn't right, tell right. didn't tell us so because well, then, then everybody's like, in jeopardy. We need, we need money now. <laughs> right. We need money now. And uh, you know, my full transparency, my decision was to not do the capital call because I'm like, if it's a sinking ship, I'm not like really the money was gonna be able to put more in to hopefully make sure yeah. we get pay, we get our money back. But he wasn't talking a whole lot of upside. So I'm like, so, you know, I'm put more money in a burning ship, but it was a great yeah. lesson. And it made me realize I'm very conservative and not all these general partners and syndicators have that same conservative nature. And yeah. like, I would never be because of how conservative I am, I would never be in that position on my own. So, you know, that, that kind of made me realize even more, I'm really looking forward to more and more of those type of deals coming back and putting into my own deals. And I don't want to scare anybody off because I'm in over 40 and that's the yeah, only yeah. deal I've ever, I, that's ever gone wrong for me. So syndications yeah. are great, but, I, but I'm still not in control of the risk profile. Yeah. And that's what that lesson taught me. Yeah. Well, and two things. I mean, one, it's interesting that the the one syndication that goes bad is the one where you were like, hey, I got this. Let me just go outside, not run it by the person. But two, I want to ask you a question because you really seem like you have the building relationships has always been your thing. For a newer investor, even investors who haven't really partnered much, how do you know when you can really trust someone? Because say you have 40 syndications, 39 are good, one went bad. That, that's like a phenomenal track record. But you also have other partnerships going, and that includes your lending business. So how do you know that you can trust someone? How much vetting are you doing that makes you comfortable enough when you're either deploying money or in either way, in a lending capacity or as part of a syndication or JB deal? You you never really know, you know, because people are great at disguising, hiding, you know, they might have went through issues and they're hiding it. Like, you know, I'm hearing about some GPs like moving forward, they might be doing capital calls and and then in their future decks, not including the property that went bad. So it's like, all right, they had 10 that went good and two that went bad, but they're not like so you can never know for sure. But I would say position yourself to where it's mutually beneficial and you have a bunch of different people around who, who are vouching for that person. So, you know, um, I'll, if I'm meeting, you know, a syndicator, I want to meet, I want to know who else is invested. And I like talking to other investors. How have your experience been? Questions like, when do you get your K-1s? <laughs> Cause yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a huge deal. Yeah. Things, things like, you know, do they, do they tell you things promptly? Are, are you updated? Do they, have they ever missed a, a pref? You know, you, if you're getting supposed to get paid quarterly, I'm counting on that income. Have they ever right. missed that? And track record is huge. So, you know, even as a lender, I've turned down so many deals in the last few months just because it's like, I like you, but I want somebody who has a process down. 
You know, you yeah, come yeah. back to me, you come back to me with five or 10 deals under your belt and we might be able to build a relationship and I'll be your guy moving forward. But like, I just not comfortable being the person who's taking the, the long shot on, on anyone. Yeah. That's unfortunate because I know everybody has to start somewhere, but that somewhere is not with me. Yeah. And th- that's how I kind of view it with anybody I work with. I want experience, success, and somebody who has the long game in mind. Like for me, it's like, you see, I'm an athlete. I pay attention to people who want to hit a lick. And what I mean by that is like, oh, make it big, make it big, this one deal. But yeah. it's like, if you if you understand, I'm really in the trenches in this real estate. I love this stuff. If you do right by me, I want you to make a little bit of money, but you're going to make way more over time by you know, handling things right way, being professional, paying off your debt if it's a loan, all that, then, you know, screwing me over, overcharging me. So I think a combination of those things has put me in a position where I feel like overall I've had good discernment, but there's there's no 100%. Yeah, no, those are really good points. And I think you made a good point about being the lender. It's that some people think like, oh, well, you're lending. So even if they don't pay, then you can just foreclose. But like none of us want to foreclose. That's a failure for everyone. Then we have to dispose of the property. So you're really looking for solid people to lend to who are going to close their deals, pay on time, and then win-win. They make money, you make the money that you expect it to make. And then it's better all around. Like you said, that that generates many more repeat customers and anything. And I think that one thing that probably newer investors don't know is that everything's about repeat customers in real estate. Because once you find the funnel that you like, it's great to keep doing business like we were talking about with the syndications. Have you found now that like, you're going to be working with the same partners, of course, some new ones will come in and prove themselves. But once you've developed like this big group, where you can rely on them, you've already built the trust, they've closed the deals, you've seen the track record yourself, you don't really need to like seek outside, you'll just see what comes. Yeah. I mean, and to speak on that, when it comes to syndications, that's why it's like one lesson I've learned, even in the one that I recently told you about that failed is like, I'm in so many deals and I've dealt with some syndicators that have done great by me in the last decade. Like there might be some new syndicators and some opportunities out there that are great, but honestly, I don't need any new ones. Yeah. Like, well, why am I taking on, why am I, that's added risk. Like when I have proven a proven track record of working with syndicators that have proven it to me, not just other like, but I've shown it to me. So a lesson I've learned even in, in that is like, why am I taking on any new syndicators ever? At this point, <laughs> when I when I'm in over forty deals, and a large portion of them have done really well by me, pick the top ten maybe, and those are right. the ones I'll consider going going back to over and over. I'm going to say no to everybody else, and and that's hard because there's going to be some great opportunities, I'm sure, and there's young and uh, coming people or syndicators I haven't heard about before, but it's like. Why take on that risk when I have a good thing? Like, don't break what what doesn't need to be broken. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So tell us a little bit about 42 Solutions and why you decided to get into lending. I mean, obviously, it's not an easy business, but once you figure it out, it's smart and you can help people and obviously get a good return. Uh, How long ago did you start it? And then what's the what's the goal, the overall goal for you? Yeah. So I've been lending for the last like three years, but I started it this year and my mindset was like, all right, I don't have any true income, obviously, besides dividends from syndications and my and income from properties. But like that's focused solely on 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 income. And then if I go and reinvest in syndications and our our properties, that's an eight percent return. Can I get better than that? Can, um, can I get better than that so I can replace my NFL income, start to buy more properties, all that? And I was just looking and I'm like, the lending I've done the last few years have been great to me. So I started reading a couple of books, a Lend to Live, shout out Big BP for that, and a couple of other books on the topic. I got a chance to talk to James Dannard. I reached out to a couple of other lenders that, that I knew. So once again, relationships. And yeah. there's a lot to it, but there, it's also not that hard. Like, you know, you all you got to do is decide on the template documents that you want, like promissory note, deed of trust, a mortgage, right. a loan, a term sheet. Like, what are the core documents? And then, like, you you get those formulated and you got to pay for those up front. And then you start to systemize, all right, what's the steps of, of this loan process? And I was kind of jocking and taking notes on other people who, yeah. what, what are your process? Can you kind of walk me through what that process looks like? And kind of created my own. I'm refining it as I go. And once you have that, it's kind of like if you're an investor already, you get to underwrite the deal. 
but it's already underwritten. So you're underwriting the underwriting essentially. Right. It's like, do I believe in the person and, and the deal? And if you do, you fund and you know, you go through your, your process, your checklist. And if you don't, then it's like, I'm not willing to do this or this is a little riskier. I'm going to change the terms and take it or leave it type of situation. So, you know, it's, there's a lot to lending and I don't want to make it sound too simple, but like it is an amazing business. And for me, and what I think a lot of people who have jobs or maybe have capital, whatever your situation is, like a great revenue source is to lend. And what a lot of real estate um, investors do, like, all right, what's ways to to generate income so you can invest? There's people who are agents. So they they make agent money, they sell properties, yep. that brings them money so they can buy. They're flipping houses. You flip some houses and now you got capital. So maybe you flip five and buy one or flip three. You know, there's people doing that. But like, if you have a nine to five job or you come into money and you could lend and get a double digit return on that money, I think more people need to consider that as a third option of cash flow to couple with investing. And that's what that's what I did because I'm like, I don't want to become an agent and I'm not trying to be a flipper myself, but I can yeah. fund the flippers. So, you know, that that was my mindset and perspective. And I, I like I think more people should should either start their own companies and do it too, or hey, hit me up and I can help you get into some loans and give you a good return. Yeah. You know, I think I think it's a great avenue that people need to realize. Yeah, I I've definitely been thinking about it. So I'll hit you up afterwards because I really think like I have the capital to deploy and I also I like the idea of helping flippers. You made such an important point that I don't want everyone to miss. When you were talking about underwriting the underwriter, that's also part of the deal vetting that you were talking about. So if someone you know, brings you a deal and they say, I want to get your money on this and their underwriting is terrible, like that's not a good client for you because they're already either trying to snow you or they don't know what they're doing. So just underwriting the underwriting can tell you everything. If somebody's numbers are perfect and you underwrite and you're like, wow you know, like that's a solid client that's going to go on for years because you're all on the same page. Your underwriting is the same. That's just a really good point. And I think people can learn from kind of modified due diligence. You're not the upfront person, you're secondary. But if their numbers check out, that's a great person to lend to, right? Yeah. I mean, ab absolutely. And, you know, I think how they, pre how they present it, the level of detail, one of the first couple, couple things I look at is the scope of work. Are right, you planning on rehabbing yeah, this? Yeah. Do you have a detailed scope of work? Do you have a contract with your contractor keeping them to this budget? You know, other things I look at is holding time. Like, you know, if, and what's normal in your market. Like if you're saying, if your whole deal is hinged upon, this is going to be a three month hold. And, <laughs> you know, in today's market, it's taken four, five, six, seven months. Like I, like I like that's one. That's another thing I look at initially is like what, how aggressive are they? Because I think yeah. with flippers, the number one thing that tanks a deal is holding costs. Because oh, I'm, yeah. I'm hitting, I'm hitting you overhead for double digit interest. And if you haven't baked that into your to your underwriting, and, right. and you're planning on getting out in two months, and it takes <laughs> six months, and that puts you 40k in the hole. Like I'm, yeah. I'm out. I'm not. I'm not interested. So understanding that, those are like right now. Before I look at anything, I'm looking at scope of work and and CMAs, and and then you know their holding time, and and do I feel that's realistic? Are they giving themselves even if it shows that they can? The market says you can sell in four. I really like the investors who are underwriting to six anyway. Yeah, yeah. Six, um, to, I, to, <laughs> six is so like, like the like men. Six, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because like you may, and these are great points because I think like if you're looking at it and people even don't know their area that well and it's a little complicated and they say 90 days and then the permits aren't even back for 35 days and it's an area where they're like, no, you're not starting work without permits. Like, are you going to get a red card? And then you do get a red card and then you're at nine months. Like you said, that adds up. You have to really bake it in for longer. I've definitely gone over on some flips, but it was, I knew, I knew what I was doing and I knew where I messed up, but I can see that happening. And like you said, we were saying, you don't want to be in that situation as a lender. You don't want to have to be, I mean, it's cool. You're going to get the extra money, but that's not a win-win for everybody. So it's kind of like you feel bad that you're taking more, but you know, you told them <laughs> their numbers I, I, were off. I'd rather, I'd rather make more money by getting into another deal with you exactly. than going, yeah. through that, going through that process. Yeah, I feel like that's like very upfront and approachable lending strategy, though, because I feel like obviously hard money lenders, your traditional hard money lender, you know, if you just had an avatar, not good, you know, they're just like, hey, 16%. Yeah, if you go over great, you know, if you capsize it, we'll foreclose, you know, they're just taking the big bucks. But I feel like you're working more 
based on you the way that you build relationships in a cooperative model, you know, with your borrower. And I think that really says something because that's a better way of doing business, which is going to, again, be a little bit more passive for you because there's not going to be problems. You know, yeah. stuff will come I, up. I want, I want my borrowers to win and I want them to win yeah. big. And, uh, you know, um, I'm I'm OK with that. And, you know, I, I support that fully. And because if they're winning big, I'm I'm getting a piece of that. And, you know, we can keep doing business over and over. So I yeah. uh, for once again, I think that's a long term mindset is like I don't want to. This is a one stop shop. It's me, my bookkeeper and yeah. who, who's overseeing everything and and my lawyer. Like eventually, maybe I'll hire a transaction coordinator and, you know, uh, maybe someone who helps me underwrite. But like full transparency, that's it's that's me. It's me and my lawyer and bookkeeper figuring yeah. it all out. So I'm not trying to overcomplicate this. I want to get with people who know what they're doing and f- help them and help them, you know, grow their business and, and make it a win win. Yeah. I love it. Uh, Before we hop off, tell us a little bit about your new book. I saw you. You're flying around. You're on the book tour. So tell us about It All Adds Up. What's in there? How are you helping people design their game plan for financial success? You know, it's a book that was a passion project for me. I love financial literacy and being an athlete. To be honest, I started to read a lot of financial books and it was nothing but middle to late age white guys talking (laughs) about finance. And I'm like, I, I understand what they're saying, but I know a lot of people don't or won't pick it up. Yeah. So, you know, I felt like with the access that I've had, my life being going to the college I'm into, being an athlete, I've gotten into rooms that a lot of people don't necessarily get into. And there's some gatekeeping there, in my opinion. So it's For like, sure. how can I be a bridge to to give more of this information, to give these perspectives and mindset? And it all adds up was, was uh, you know, my passion project to attack that and get it in the hands of kids and, and adults, you know, of all ages all across the country. And, you know, I'm super excited about it. But I, I appeared on like one or two other podcasts, but I think yours might end up coming out first. So I wanted to tell you, yeah. I just signed a deal with Bigger Pockets. And I'm going to be writing awesome. another book that's coming out in October. So that's Amazing. going to be coming out. And I, I don't, I haven't nailed down the title exactly, but the essence of the book is, is how to invest passively, um, you know, while you have a nine to five job and, and how yeah. to build a real estate empire while still working, which, you know, obviously uh, me being an athlete and, and what I did the last decade kind of speaks to that. So I'm excited to write that book. It's going to be another, you know, passion for me as well. And I'm glad to kind of announce it. I I hope your podcast is the first one that comes out. Yeah. Well, congrats. That's awesome. And I I love it. I think you have a YouTube video, like along that same line of that same similar thing. But I think it is so important what you said, if you can be the bridge, even for kids who are like, you know, really into sports, like I've always said, like, I was lucky I grew up, my dad was an investor, he taught me everything. So I was like playing with real estate. But like, your regular high school education and middle school, nobody's talking about real estate and investing. But if they did, maybe there'd be different opportunities out there for so many different people who never thought like, hey, that could be an opportunity. You only, I only need to earn 3.5% down to house hack a multifamily when I get older. If you learn that in high school, you can plan for that and you can do it way quicker. It's just like nobody knows. So I'm right with you. I'm really excited for people to read your book now and then to get on that new bigger pockets one when it comes out. So congratulations. That's awesome. And being the bridge to hopefully kids. And like you said, adults who maybe just, they never thought it was going to be an option. Yeah. That's fantastic stuff. Absolutely, man. Yeah, man. Well, it's been a pleasure. I'm glad we finally locked this down and got it done. You're a busy guy. I'm busy, but I'm really excited that we got this. And yeah, I look forward to continuing our friendship. We'll hit it up at bigger pockets next year in Cancun. (laughs) It's going to be exciting. Gonna be a blast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 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 I have to catch up offline. I got to hear about all, all what you're doing. Maybe yeah. one of the markets you're in. I know you're in New York, but yeah. you know, it might, it might make sense for us to do some stuff together in the future. So let's, yeah, let's have I'd love that to. Combo, combo as well. Yeah. And I'm definitely going to talk to you about the lending because I've been interested. I just want to see how you, how you set it up and, and got it going. And yeah, we'll be in touch afterwards, but I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for being on the show. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Yep. That was Devon Kennard. I'm Jonathan Green. We'll see you next episode. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing with me, Jonathan Green. 
And I just want to remind you, and this is always an uncomfortable part, I don't want you to think that I'm begging for you to like, subscribe, follow, do whatever you have to do for the podcast, leave a five-star review. But if you like the podcast and you think it adds value in the real estate investing sphere, then just do me a personal favor. Like the podcast, follow it, share it when you can with your friends, and be so kind as to write a five-star review if you believe it deserves a five-star review up against what else is out there. I would really appreciate it, and I hope you keep listening. Keep listening.